and streaming uh, in different channels today. The key topic of uh, to this year's Festival of Ideas is World in Fever, Surviving the Crisis Together. The Ideas Festival is a large scale event uh, which uh, gather leaders from all over the world discuss global challenges and seek ways to uh, overcome them. During last three years, the Ideas Festival took place in Odessa, of course, offline. This year is the first festival, uh, digital one, digital version. The festival is organized by the Aspen Institute Kiev and Impact Hub Odessa. Uh, before I introduce you to our wonderful panelists, uh, I would like also to share with you some important information. Uh, this event will be, as uh, a session, will, will uh, also co host by Impact Hub Global Network within the seventh edition of Live with Impact Hub series. Live with Impact Hub yet. It is a series of online global events to inspire, connect, and enable a multi-location audiences of entrepreneurs, ventures, organizations, and companies around strategic topics such as community building, community building, impact creation, innovations, and sustainable development goals. Uh, so welcome to everyone who is uh, watching us uh, in the stream. Uh, one more thing, uh, I would like to remind the rules of participation for our participants and panelists as well. We will have the session, uh, the session will last for 50, 55 minutes. We will have 10, 15 minutes for the question in the end of the session. Please uh, write down your questions in Q&A session. We have chat, which is open for informal communication, but please uh, put all your questions into Q&A section so we could respond to them in the end. Uh, if you have any technical issues, don't hes hesitate to leave the message in chat. We will be glad to uh, help you with them. Uh, please follow the netiquette. Our technical team will remove all viol violators from the session, but I believe there are not such people with us today. So uh, finishing with technical aspects, uh, let me introduce uh, the moderator of the next uh, panel, which is dedicated to what uh, coronavirus means for a global economy, Natalie Yaresko. Natalie is uh, a chair of Aspen Institute Kyiv. That's for us the most important role, but also Natalie served as Minister of Finance in Ukraine and now serves as um, executive director of uh, Financial Overseeing Board in Puerto Rico. And Natalie, the floor is yours. I wish you a productive, effective, and interesting, uh, full of insights conversation. And dear participants, prepare your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yulia. Thanks to Aspen Institute Kiev and the Impact Hub Odessa for hosting us. Thank you to all those who are participating and we're, we're thrilled to be here today with you to talk about the global economy in a, in a coronavirus or hopefully a post coronavirus world. And joining me today are two outstanding speakers, uh, both of whom you probably know and have heard from before. I'd like to welcome Yuri Gorodnichenko, a native of Ukraine. He is a Quantage Presidential Professor at the Department of Economics at University of California, Berkeley. He received his bachelor's and master's at EERC at the Kiev Mohila Academy in Kiev, as well as a PhD at the University of Michigan. A significant part of his research, which is what we'll hear a lot about today, has to do with monetary policy, taxation, economic growth, and business cycles. He serves on many editorial boards, including the Journal of Monetary Economics and Vox Ukraine. He's a prolific researcher, and his work has been published in leading economics journals, cited in discussions and media, and he's received numerous awards for his research. So thank you, Yura, for being here at this early morning in California. And Vladislav Roshkovan uh, joining us. Welcome, Vladislav. Vlad is the Alternative Executive Director at the IMF, representing 15 European countries, including Ukraine, at the IMF Executive Board. Before joining the IMF, Vladislav served as Deputy Governor of the National Bank of Ukraine, responsible for Ukrainian banking sector reform strategy and the turnaround transformation of the central bank itself. Before joining the central bank in 2014, Vladislav spent eight years in the Unicredit Group. He graduated from the banking faculty of the Odessa State Economics University in 2000, and later was a researcher at the University of Genova in Italy and the Institute of World Economics 
of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. So colleagues, six months have passed since the first coronavirus case was identified in Wuhan, China, and the number of new daily COVID infections peaked last week with more than 177,000 cases being reported globally. Yet the, though the virus continues to spread like wildfire, mostly in emerging market economies and in a select number of US states, reopening plans continue. The lack of the consistency in global response has made forecasting the global economic growth quite complicated. There seem to be as many perspectives on the global economy as there are economists, maybe even more than the number of economists. The IMF has reduced its own projections since April to June, whereas the Congress US Congressional Budget Office has actually improved its forecasts from earlier this year with regard to 2021 and the recovery. According to the World Bank, the current recession is the fourth worst since 1871, second only to the declines during the two world wars of the 20th century and the Great Depression. Yet, some governments are claiming a sharp economic recovery is just ahead of us, a V recovery. Others are preparing for a slow U-shaped recovery at best. And still others are worried and preparing for a worst case scenario where a second wave of infections hits before year end, forcing another round of social distancing, economic closures called a double dip or a W scenario. What does the global economic outlook for 2020 and 2021 look like to you? Vlad, can you help us start out? Thanks, Natalka. And, uh, you know, thanks for inviting and also for, for the introductory remarks. Uh, you know, this panel is about the global, global economy. And uh, so maybe just to, to start this discussion and to set the stage, you know, probably I should start with advertising that IMF yesterday published uh, the, this update for the World Economic Outlook, uh, and the title of which is uh, Uncertain Recovery. And uh, just a few hours ago, the, the fund also issued the updated the Global Financial Stability Report, uh, which also to be probably read by the participants. Uh, and I think these two words, uh, uncertainty from one side and recovery, are very important to understand the global economy in, in the next years. Uh, but to have a picture a little bit more complete, I would add there probably two other words. Uh, one is slowdown, and another one is disconnection. And around these two word, four words, uh, I would uh, try to build the comments today and uh, hopefully to have the, 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 the discussion with, uh, uh, with Jura, probably who might not agree with these four words. So I would probably start with the word slow down. And in April, as, as you already said, Natalka, the IMF forecasted the global economic slowdown, and it was about 3%. And these projections have been already built on the figures which already at that time showed an unprecedented decline in the global activity due to COVID. New data, which we received in the last months, uh, suggest that even deeper downturn for many economists, uh, which would lead to the global slowdown by around 4.9%. These figures which have been uh, announced yesterday. And uh, there is also less optimistic forecast for 2021. And uh, so from what we can take from yesterday IMF report, and also which could be helpful to, discuss, to, to have a discussion today. The first, uh, we can see the synchronized and simultaneous deep downturn in most of the countries, advanced economies, uh, emerging markets, and low-income countries. More than 180 countries will be in decline this year, and it makes this crisis unprecedented, as you said in the introductory. For example, during the global financial crisis or GFC, you know, advanced economies were in recession, but the emerging markets like China, India, South Asia, they were generally growing. You know? Now, the first figures, first figures, first quarter figures of G GDP are generally worse than were expected, maybe a little bit uh, except uh, China, you know, Malaysia, Australia. And high frequency indicators show that the second quarter is much worse. As a result, the decline in the advanced economies uh, you know, is projected uh, at uh, minus 8% for this year. Minus 8%. This is a big, big, uh, big decline for the, for the uh, advanced economies. If to speak countries by countries, and, and you mentioned the US, uh, US is projected minus 8% as well this year. Japan minus 5.8%, UK minus 10%, Germany are around 8%. France 12.5% and Italy and Spain minus 12.8%. This is a huge, huge decline. And uh, 
in, in emerging markets and developing economies, decline is forecasted at the, at the, the level of 3%. And in India, which was yesterday the, the biggest, uh, one of the biggest uh, drivers of the global economy together with China, is projected to contrast by 4.5%. Latin America as well, you know, Brazil, Mexico, we have minus 10, minus 10%, and other uh, Latin America countries are minus 12%. All exporters countries, also Nigeria, uh, Saudi Arabia, will be also affected in parallel by the commodity crisis, you know. And it seems only that China, you know, is among the big, big economies will, will show the growth like by 1% this year. But as you understand, this is a huge revision of their, of their forecast. So this is the first big, uh, big element of the synchronized, uh, you know, downturn. But second part of this, the synchronized goes not only around the countries, uh, but also around the sectors. And because we see the decline both in production industries and also in, in the service economy, both on the corporate levels and households, both in investments and in consumption. And in this consumption is very much important because in all the previous recession, and I'm sure Yuri will tell more about that, the consumers usually use their savings in order to smooth spendings. And now this is not the case. We see due to the lockdown that the consumption went substantially down and this became a big, big aggregate demand shock for the global economy. The third big element from the report is the huge decline in the global trade. You know, WTO, ESA, and the UNTAD expect minus 27% of the global trade in the second quarter. This is unprecedented. And the fourth, you know, and here to, I mean, to finish, that um, the fourth uh, conclusion is uh, we came to this, we entered this crisis, uh, much less prepared than we, we did in, in 2008. I mean, and uh, because the, probably the world didn't listen to the words of the former IMF director, Christine Lagarde, you know, fix the roof while the sun is shining, you know? Because the main, main central banks, they somehow missed the possibility to, you know, to start raising the key rates in 2013, 2015 to harm the economic growth after the global financial crisis. And as a result, yes, the money became cheaper, the borrowings and debts elevated, but the central banks lost their ammunition to fight the crisis now. And uh, therefore they don't have enough resources to, to create the sizable economic stimulus. And uh, also as a result of the cheap money, the global debt increased and therefore limiting the, the fiscal space for, for the states uh, in order to act uh, because they already, the borrowing costs are high and the debt's already high. So all of these factors together, simultaneous deep slowdown along geographies and sectors uh, and uh, uh, pretty harsh underlying conditions uh, in, in, uh, for response policies, they will uh, definitely make this crisis as uh, Christina Georgieva said, the crisis like no other. And here I will stop. Thank you, Vlad. So Yura, do you have a different perspective? Do you see it the same way? What do you project? Thank you. You know, it's a great honor to, to join this panel. And uh, I largely agree with Sarah and what uh, Vlad said. It, it's, it's a perfect storm. And in some ways, when I teach business cycles, I emphasize that business cycles are about synchronization and commitment. And here we have a perfect example when you have perfect synchronization across countries, across sectors. And <clears throat> in terms of outlook, I guess you know one of the most troubling statistics I, I see in the data is that typically in recessions we have huge declines in investment, but consumption, especially consumption of uh, non-durable goods services, doesn't really move that much in in recessions. Even in the Great Recession, consumption of services barely changed; it didn't decline. And now we see a massive contraction of uh, consumer spending, and to me this is the most troubling signal that people have a very dim view of, of the future. And, uh, you know, this can create problems for us later when we think about the recovery stage. If people don't have optimism if they don't want to spend. This is going to be a big problem going forward. And, uh, and finally, I would also like to emphasize that uncertainty is the key word here. Nobody knows what's going to happen next. Uh, there is a lot of uncertainty. I would probably say that, in my view, the, the worst uh, stage of the panic is over you know we had days when uh, s p 500 and other major financial indices were declining by massive numbers and everybody was you know really in a state of terrible panic uh that stage uh subsided but it doesn't mean we're out of the woods we're still facing a lot of uncertainty so i'll stop here 
Thank you. Now, when 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 Vlad said earlier, you know, the, the estimate right now is that 90% of the countries in the world are suffering from a recession, the highest share in 150 years. Um, I think there's a debate, Vlad, on whether or not some federal central banks and, and, and um, have actually taken and been more prepared. Financial markets seem to be suffering less than in the 2008, 2009 financial crisis. There seems to be better regulation in place, and there seem to be some lessons learned about how to try and push money into the into the economy to improve that that consumption um, spending. But taken all together, Yura, when you look at this situation, you look at what we've learned in the past, what's worked, what it hasn't, and what's happening, what are the key actions that you believe national governments ought to be taking to minimize the downside effects of this recession? What should governments be considering doing? Or what, what, what are they already doing? What's going to work? What's going to bring us out of this? Yes, that's a great question. You know, I would say that the Great Recession was um, a very useful um, episode for us in the sense that it really helped us develop the playbook for policymakers. All the unconventional policy tools used by fiscal and monetary authorities, quantitative easing, uh, forward guidance, negative interest rates, uh, active fiscal policy. This was all developed during the Great Recession. And I think it's extremely important that people appreciate that, you know, policymakers cannot sit on their hands and hope that the crisis is going to resolve uh, by itself. And this may seem like, you know, a trivial observation, but if you go back to the Great Recession and look at the fiscal policy response, it was shocking that in many European countries, the governments basically didn't spend anything to, to help the economy. And as a result, we had a big recession there, and it was very protracted, very painful. We see all sorts of problems, not only in the economy, but also social issues. And so in this sense, I think it's very useful that this time around, policymakers are a lot more active. They're willing to spend money. Even Germany has a massive fiscal stimulus. Uh, so that's very important. We also see a lot of uh, you know, activity from central banks. Uh, I agree with Vlad that the space for their actions is, is much more limited, but it doesn't mean they're completely powerless. One thing I would say is that, you know, we see a lot of action in many governments, but in many countries, you know, we had lots and lots of countries who face, uh, face a crisis, but we don't see a lot of coordination and some countries are falling behind. For example, uh, when I look at my home country, Ukraine, I see that the National Bank of Ukraine is very active in fighting the crisis. But the fiscal policy response was, you know, very, very timid, very small, very inconsistent. And so, you know, if we don't try to have a coordinated effort in this, uh, I think it's going to hurt everybody else uh, collectively. I was hoping that the IMF and the World Bank, I don't know, maybe United Nations, some international organization, or maybe it will be US leadership, that will help coordinate this uh, policy response, be more proactive in uh, uh, fiscal spending, more proactive in monetary policy response. But it doesn't seem like this is happening. And I think this is going to be probably one of the mistakes when we look back at this and say, ah, I wish we had you know, the IMF being a coordinator of all these policy responses, but I will tell. So without a coordinated response, it's gonna be patchy, and it's going to depend on each of the national governments which of the tools they choose to use exactly. in this situation. Yeah, Vlad, exactly. How, yeah. Yuna, please. Yuna, please. Oh, exactly. I just wanted to say that you know it's already very clear when we have this uh, patches of uh, quarantines and social distancing. It's especially obvious in the United States where the the response is very decentralized, and uh, instead of one coherent framework, you have all sorts of crazy combinations, and uh, this is going to hurt everybody collectively. Vlad, tell me, how do you think governments should be acting, reacting? What tools should they be using? Uh, you know, I, I fully agree with, uh, with Yura that further coordination and more coordination and more multilateral coordination in, in order to solve the global problems is needed. Huh? But I would slightly disagree that, I mean, not many things have been done. You know, I would say massive, you know, many I mean, massive actions huh? have been done already and in an unprecedented short uh, term, you know, both globally, you know, on the level of the, look at the IMF, IMF in, uh, nine, in seven weeks uh, approved 70 emergency finances programs uh, for, for different countries, you know, for most countries which are needed in order to tackle the, the health crisis. And this is unprecedented, you know, but uh, if you look at the, uh, on the, um, on the local, on local space, uh, 
I mean, there are also many actions have been done, and many of them, believe me, they have been coordinated with, with the fund. Uh, and a um, few days ago, the investment bank uh, BlackRock, uh, you know, they, um, uh, they, they issued the report and they said that the global uh, macroeconomic policy has gone through nothing but a revolution, you know, because, uh, I mean, in a, in a very short period, like in a few months, uh, because if to compare with the policy response to the global financial crisis, we currently see completely different scale. Not only the response has been faster, but the scale also became greater. Look, I mean, how now massively the fiscal deficits or budget deficits are increasing throughout the world. And I, by the way, agrees with that, you know, from the general concept of the fiscal consolidation, including in Ukraine, we're usually going to like 2% and Andalka knows very well how difficult it to decrease uh, the budget deficit, uh, you know, from the high levels uh, to the very, I mean, to low level and sustainable levels. But now in, the, in this year, the, uh, the budget deficit uh, will be, you know, close to 8%. And yesterday we had a briefing on about Africa. This is an average budget deficit for this year for most of the African countries, you know, which is a very, um, uh, you know, maybe unsustainable on longer term. So I would say many things have been done. You know, the central banks, ministries uh, of finance and health authorities, they acted a lot on the front line to the, to the, to the, uh, on, for the response of the crisis. Central banks did a lot. Uh, you know, they, they have many novelties in their policies as well, in monetary policies. Many countries, many central banks, which did not use it before the quantitative easing started using it. And many advanced economies, central banks started, uh, you, I mean, significant, significantly increased uh, the asset purchases in order to give money to the economy, to give liquidity to the economy and to, you know, uh, which, uh, and, and they actually succeeded, which did not bring a substantial increase of borrowing costs. Uh, and which also helps the economy to recover. You know, many central banks open the swap lines, uh, you know, and fiscally, you know, I would say that, I, and again, I'm sure that Natalka will understand me very, very well on this. Uh, I think one of the major advices to the, to the Ministry of Finance is, yes, uh, take this year seriously, spend wisely, but not make these exceptional costs of this year structural. You know, and especially in the countries where the elections will be in autumn, including Ukraine, I'm, I'm waiting for the budget discussion, you know, for the next year, how many politicians would like to keep these costs forward. And I think this is important to, to observe. Taken together what you're saying, though, you know, if, if, if there have been a lot of actions and they've been relatively quick, but yet we're still seeing projections that are dire in many, many countries. Um, what should all of our participants be looking at? What kinds of indicators should we be looking at in terms of which way this is going to move? What should we be following? What should people be paying attention to in terms of indicators or actions of governments? Yura? No, I will start that with, with saying that probably the single biggest uh, source of uncertainty is if we're going to have a second wave of COVID infections or not. If we see that infections climb up, we'll see another round of lockdowns. We know they're extremely costly for the economy. And unless we can come up with some more targeted approaches to containing the outbreak, so we don't lock down everybody, maybe we can uh, protect you know, vulnerable portions of the population or come up with some other technology to minimize the, um, the, the negative impact on the economy. Um, so I would say, you know, the second wave is, is, is the most dangerous. Another thing I agree with a lot that uh, we have uh, to think about the policy response in, in the following way, I guess. Uh, we, we have a shortfall of income. We have a loss of income. We try to bridge this. Uh, but to build the bridge, you have to see the other side of the river, right? If you can't bri build bridges to nowhere. You can't spend your way out of this. Floor, right? You have to have a temporary measure, otherwise you have to have structural responses. And so my concern is that, you know, many policymakers will be so concerned that they don't see the other side of, of the river that they will have a timid policy response. They will tie, uh, try to tighten monetary policy probably too, too early or limit their fiscal response too early. Um, so, you know, that would be another variable for me uh, to keep an eye on. And finally, I guess the general level of pessimism, if people think, okay, this is a new normal, I don't want to spend, the savings rate uh, continues to be at the extremely elevated levels, that would be a very bad sign. If 
we don't see people spending, that's going to be a problem for advanced economies and then through trade linkages also for emerging economies. So three variables, policy response, second wave, and uh, general pessimism of the consumers. Vlad, do you want to add something? Um, I fully agree with uh, what, uh, what Yura just said. Uh, I mean, probably we, I just need to add, uh, I mean, few elements on this level, and, but I would try to a little bit uh, widen the, the frame uh, because I think the indicators are important, but I would look a little bit wider. So first we need to look that uh, the fund still projects uh, the, the recovery in 2021, which is, uh, I mean, there are a lot of assumptions, uh, but factually we speak about 5.4% economic growth in 2021. Uh, which is uh, already a little bit lower than it was assumed to be in April. And uh, what is also important, that recovery is uneven. So not in all countries will go substantially up. Uh, some of them go to different direction. And uh, you mentioned in the beginning, Natalka, the, the issue, if it's we recovery or you recovery, you know, or W, I mean, We're definitely, de definitely you don't see in IMF report anything about the recovery, you know? Countries don't expect this. I mean, the IMF does not expect it. World Bank does not expect it. I would say even the U recovery goes or U recovery goes already in the past. So you can find even on the official slide of the of the IMF that we speak now about or Nike or Swoosh recovery. So the which means that the virus definitely will be contained one day in future. We don't know when. Might take ever several waves, and many sectors will have longer term structural damages, uh, which, will affect, which will affect the longer term trend growth. And I think this is important, uh, but I fully agree with uh, Yura that uncertainty is the major word uh, which we, look, we need to look at. And even with the uncertainty and with the recovery that you're describing, the IMF projects, the World Bank projects, pretty much everyone projects a recovery in 2021. That recovery is still not to the levels of pre-COVID, pre pre-coronavirus. It is still a weak recovery as compared to what we're losing in 2020. But this is not just a health crisis. It's not just an economic crisis. There's a trade crisis, as you mentioned, Vlad. There's an oil crisis going on. There's a transportation crisis. You look at what's happening to the airline industry. So Vlad, what sectors of global trade and economy are most at risk? What, who stands to benefit from these changes? What should businesses be doing to reorient, reposition themselves for what the new world will look like as we recover, as we recover, excuse me. I mean, you, you absolutely correctly, uh, I mean, I mean, framed it, uh, you know, in a few, uh, like a month ago, I had a lecture for speech in Deloitte, with Deloitte C CEO companies, you know, and uh, I used the word, the, the cocktail of risks. So we have a cocktail of risks, uh, which is absolutely correct. And we are still living through the cocktail of risks. So, and uh, this affects a lot. Two days ago, I was speaking with a friend of mine and we were discussing the, the new normal, you know, as, uh, as you were mentioned. Uh, and, we, uh, and I was saying, what will change? You know, I was asking what will change because we need to be very clear, the COVID did not, maybe except social distancing, did not, uh, start any new trends, but the um, global trends, the, but the COVID substantially accelerated other trends. Uh, and therefore we need to understand that, uh, you know, just to avoid the, the paradox of survival, survival the, that uh, we will have the problem uh, that we will see only on those who survive. We need to understand really who will be most affected. But the second issue is uh, not only who will uh, benefit, uh, not, not only those who will be affected and who will change, but my friend of mine said, it's important to look what will stay. And this is very important also, you know, not only what will change, but what also will stay. So what will change? And, uh, you know, one of the big factors of the, of the current crisis is definitely the, the, the level of mobility, you know, is substantially affected and it long-term will be affected. So the transport industry will be substantially impacted. I mean, no way, this is already the fact, and this is a global, uh, uh, global structural damage for the for the for the sector. I don't know if if uh, Yuri has a other opinion, especially air industry. You know, the definitely the energy. You know, linked to that also the energy for the next few years it will be a big problem. Not only with the risk uh, for the energy crisis, you know, but energy consumption is substantially lower as of today. And definitely banks. 
you know, banks, because tomorrow these banks who are now are supporting the, the economy with a lot of these lifelines to support the businesses, uh, they will see tomorrow the non-performing loans on their balance sheets. Uh, I mean, no doubt. Uh, and therefore, we will, uh, the, the, the central banks will have to do this. But what will be, what will stay or what, what will be benefiting, you know, what industries will be benefiting? It's very clear that the health industry is benefiting. You will see it on the stock markets uh, today already. But I mean that uh, I mean definitely the soap. You know we will wash a lot of our, a lot of hands. Uh, you know uh, many times. So the soap uh, definitely um, uh, and the personal hygiene will substantially uh, improve. The food. Uh, you know I think that the demand for food uh, will uh, structurally change, but will be still high. Also because we will have more population in the world. Uh, uh, because any pandemics can affect it substantially. And uh, I mean, there will be a lot of home, uh, home, home food, uh, you know, um, uh, production and will change a lot of habits, uh, not in favor of restaurants, but more in, in favor of uh, at home dining. You know, everything which will connect with social connection, I think is very much important in the current circumstances. There was an interesting presentation of EBRD a few months ago. They, they are projecting that the real estate and especially commercial real estate will be substantially negatively affected in the major uh, major cities in the town in the um, in the centers of the cities. But they are projecting this in, this substantial increase of demand for the suburbans, uh, you know, for the real estate in suburbans uh, and for and development the, the secondary cities. I would say also the payments industries will substantially uh, benefit and everything which is online. And the final thing here, um, uh, and uh, if I may uh, ask uh, uh, maybe for other panels and maybe just participants to think, uh, I think we need to, to, to work on or think about the words uh, which will stay with us through all this crisis. And one of the words which comes to my mind uh, and which I also discussed with my friends is empathy. Everything which will uh, be linked with empathy because we are really missing the hugs, uh, we are really, really missing the handshakes. Uh, so whatever will help us uh, to keep the empathy even on the distance, uh, I think will benefit in the future. You know, what about, what about segments of the economy that are so critical, for example, to Ukraine, migrant work, remittances? How is all of this going to change the future in, in segments of the economy like that or other sectors? You know, it's a, it's, it's a great question. I agree with what Vlad said that, uh, you know, usually recessions are reallocation shocks. Somebody is more affected uh, than, than, uh, than another sector. Here it's an extreme version where lots of sectors are particularly badly affected. And uh, it's going to have, you know, very heterogeneous effects on uh, on various countries. For example, Ukraine depends on migrant labor remittances, right? Is this going to be a problem? Most likely, yes. Preliminary data suggests that remittances are declining. On the other hand, you know, Ukraine had a lot of foreign travel. People went and spent their money in Italy or other countries. Uh, this international travel is uh, over. And so in this sense, we have actually an improvement in the current account because of this reason. Also, Ukraine, uh, you know, supplies a lot of food. Uh, people will always have demand for food. And so in some ways, Ukraine is going to be a benefactor of this. But it may be also maybe somewhat uh, more unexpected with winners and losers. For example, we were discussing with Vlad that uh, one thing that may happen in this round is that the global chains are going to get a lot shorter. And for example, European Union would like to move uh, production closer to itself, so it doesn't depend on China, for example. And uh, Ukraine, Romania, or similar countries where labor is relatively cheap may be the main benefactors of, of this kind of trends. Now, I wouldn't say this is going to automatically help Ukraine or Romania or countries like that, because you know now labor has to uh, fight with robots. Robots became a lot more um, affordable, more cheap. And uh, as a result, uh, you know, the incentives to relocate uh, production into low wage countries is going to be reduced. Uh, now, I'll probably have a more positive outlook than Vlad on uh, some sectoral dynamics. <clears throat> I guess, you know, my, my example is uh, what happened to the airlines uh, after the 9-11. Everybody saw that the air travel is done. There is no way people will want to fly again. It was a massive fear of flying. 
And uh, it's true, the airlines went through massive, massive contraction. But then within two years, there were technological uh, developments. You know, people established metal detectors and other technologies um, to make air travel uh, safer. And in two, three years, airlines completely recovered. And if you look, you know, what happened to airlines just before the great, uh, you know, this recession now, you would never see in the time series that anything like 9-11 had a permanent effect uh, on, on this uh, industry. So my hope is that, you know, technological improvements will come along and, uh, you know, we'll have to go back to restaurants, uh, cinemas, we'll have personal touch again, <laughs> handshakes and hugs. <laughs> Be a little bit more optimistic there. Absolutely. I'm gonna give you Natalka, one more may, 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 Natalka, may, may I comment on, on two on two small small uh, small issues here? Yes. Yeah, because uh, I, you know I, I fully agree with uh, with you around that, uh, and uh, uh, we don't need to forget that the crisis uh, in many cases is a big uh, nudge, a big push for the change. Opportunity. It's an opportunity. And the big opportunity and big opportunity both for countries, as you pro properly absolutely mentioned. Uh, especially when the, the, the global value chains will do, you know, the, the changes uh, and they will change, yeah? you know, and, uh, but not only, you know, it's exactly the, the, the issue for the technological, you know, for the progress, you know, technological progress, which are inevitable, you know, in this respect. And uh, maybe to come back to the previous discussion on the policies, uh, you know, I think we didn't discuss the labor policies uh, because the labor policies are crucial, especially for the recovery. For many countries, not only for not only for Ukraine, and uh, and linking to the fiscal policies, we will probably need to reallocate some part some part of the spending to support the, those who are, who don't have work. You know, to those who might need to maybe reallocate to other place, place from one region to another, uh, in order to in the places where the, the, there will be demand for job. And for Ukraine, it's very difficult because Ukraine is not so mobile inside of the country. And probably we'll need also to stimulate some kind of retrainings and upskilling and reskilling of employees of the enterprises. And this could be the good government spendings in, and investments for the future of Ukraine. Of course. And I'm going to finish with my last question. I'm asking all participants to send in any questions you have so we have time to answer them. But before we go to your questions, the last question for both of you, either of you, so you've all mentioned policy solutions that have used, been used previously, maybe are being used today. Are there any lessons learned? Do you have any examples of countries that you think have done it well to date, managed the crisis well? Maybe New Zealand is an example. Or have you seen any countries that have managed it poorly? And I'm, I'm talking less about the healthcare response than the economic policy response. Do you have any examples of success or failed policies that we ought to be watching and reflecting on as we move forward? Either of you? No one. You know, I would say Germany, I, I agree with some island nations uh, did very well in terms of uh, containing the pandemic and minimizing the uh, fallout in terms of uh, the economy like New Zealand and Australia, but you know, they're very special in many ways. You can uh, seal the borders and uh, limit travel. So in this sense, they're very unique. Uh, you have to look at countries where, you know, you're connected to the rest of the world by land or <laughs> by other means of transportation, which people can use easily. I would say Germany is probably surprisingly, um, you know, in some case, in some sense, it would be, you know, a country doing surprisingly well. You know, they're willing to spend, uh, they contain the outbreak, uh, they had a lot of uh, support from the uh, ECB, and so it, it worked out pretty well. In terms of you know poor responses, uh, unfortunately there are many, many, many examples. Brazil would be one, like you know where you see like a total meltdown in terms of the economy, healthcare, and uh, uh, I guess every statistic. And unfortunately, there are many countries like this. Vlad, I uh, again I, I I agree with with you. Right? You know, it's even not interesting what you agree with everything. You know what you were saying because. Uh, it's very complimentary what I would love to say, you know, you said that. Probably I would add here uh, just, uh, I mean, maybe two elements. One is, uh, you know, I used in the beginning the word disconnection, you know, and uh, this disconnection, uh, what I would mean uh, is, um, you know, we are discussing now pretty 
not, not so bright picture anyway, you know, for at least for 2020, 2021, it's not so bright. And I fully agree that even by end of 2021, we will not reach the level of end of 2019. Huh? But, uh, you know, we have a global slowdown, uh, global trade slowdown, uh, decrease of the consumption, decrease of the production, different industries. industries. But when you look at the U.S. Uh, stock market, uh, the, the, the stock prices uh, return back to the January. And this is a complete disconnection, you know, with a real economy and the capital markets. And this disconnection is a big vulnerability for, for the U.S. economy, you know. And I think this is a, we need, uh, we, we, we need to, you know, to have this uh, um, in, in mind. Uh, and um, in respect of the um, country support, uh, you know, uh, as an IMF, I cannot maybe I mean, say praise or not praise other countries, but uh, what I would uh, you know, look uh, is, uh, um, and yesterday we had a call with uh, Darren Ajumaglu, uh, still the, the institutions play. The institutions play a huge role. If we have the credible institutions with a credible policies to which people trust, you know, these countries actually go in the right direction and they tackle this crisis and definitely will come up uh, as winners. Uh, in the countries with uh, institutions where people don't trust, uh, you know, the lockdown will be complicated and the second wave will be complicated. Uh, and therefore, this is, a, this is crucial, I think. All right, we're going to move to the questions that you've been sending us. We have a lot of them, and I'm going to go from the general to the specific. I'll try, <clears throat> and you don't have to both answer each question. You just feel free to jump in if you would like to speak to the specific topic. So from Facebook, I'm curious if the COVID crisis has offset the trends that were supposed to bring about the next economic crisis in the world. We know that crises are cyclical, and there are certain economic indicators that the next crisis is coming. And these, there were many discussions about the one to come before COVID, and then the pandemic came and changed all the trends. Could it be that COVID has now eliminated those other trends and those other cyclical crises, and they're going to be eliminated? So we've only replaced one for the other? Maybe I can start. You know, one, one thing with business cycles is that you never know what is going to be a problem and when it's going to happen. Nobody knew the Great Recession is going to happen. Nobody knew that 91 recession is going to happen, that oil crisis is going to happen. And so in this sense, COVID is no exception. It was a total unexpected force. And uh, in some sense, we're very unprepared. Now, I should also say that uh, you know, there is little evidence that uh, crisis depend on how long an economy has been in an expansion. So, you know, you can have an expansion for three years, five years, 10 years. It doesn't mean that as you spend more time in an expansion stage, you are bound to have a crisis. You have many examples where countries didn't have recessions for many, many, many years. I guess one famous example is Australia, which didn't have recessions since early 90s. Um, and, you know, China didn't have recessions. I mean, China is a special case, but, you know, it didn't have recessions, really. It didn't have a contraction. Of input. Um, so in this sense, I, I don't think you know COVID is uh, unusual, but I agree that you know probably some imbalances were building up, and uh, COVID just you know exposed them, made them you know laid them bare. So in this sense, it's true. Uh, in terms of longer long-term trends, um, you know nobody knows. In the long run, we're all dead. Uh, but I would say. <laughs> But I would say, you know, there is basically like an iron law of economic growth in the United States. If you look at the last 200 years and look at uh, the rate at which GDP per capita grew, it was 2% over many, many, many decades. And uh, I have a hard time thinking, you know, what is different now relative to what we had in the previous 200 years and uh, why we shouldn't have 2% growth again in the future. We had pandemics, we had world wars, we had all sorts of crises. Nonetheless, the economy rebound and we kind of continue to go 2%. Now, US is unusual in some sense because it didn't have wars for many years on its soil. Uh, but I think it just that's an example that we can have prosperity in the long run and we shouldn't think that uh, COVID is going to be the end of it. Thank you. Here's probably another one from Facebook. Were the quarantine limitations even worth introducing given the economic downslide? I think it's a, the, the answer for this is a, is a complicated, uh, and still we need to look for this uh, in future. You know, what uh, we may, what, what the um, you know 20th and 21st century shows us, uh, but we need to 
trust uh, the professionals. We need to trust those who have an expertise, uh, not always to politicians. And uh, the professionals uh, in this uh, specific area say that uh, social distancing was a must uh, in order to substantially reduce uh, the development of the crisis. Uh, and they still say that the crisis is, I mean, the, the, the medical uh, risk is pretty high and it's pretty deadly. And uh, in order to flatten the curve, we had to go to lockdowns. Uh, and for sure, these lockdowns affected the global economy and the fog affected the local economies, absolutely. And uh, here, the, as I said before, the institutions should have played uh, and the institutions should have responded uh, properly. And definitely this response was not was uneven just because different countries, they have different uh, uh, different levels of capacity to, to respond to this. Huh? And maybe to add one word to what you said on the previous question, um, I would add the word fragility. You know, those countries who are fragile, who have many weaknesses, have been affected and will be affected much more in the long term than those who are, have stable institutions and more uh, healthy economies. I'm going to combine two questions here related for you. One is one of our participants says that, quote, I may predict that the movement, I think this is in Ukraine, will go from being a source of a country sourcing wood, food production and IT to outsourcing and technology uh, from IT outsourcing and technology to the next level, like our own pr production. And that this will happen because of supply chain changes that Yura was mentioning earlier, that are they're going to be post COVID. And I'll unite that with the, the question, which skills will be required after the corona crisis? Is this an opportunity for innovation and the IT sector in Ukraine? In other words, is this going to change the nature of the Ukrainian economy? Well, this is a different question. <laughs> because, I mean, the, 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 previous, the answer to the previous question, uh, you know, if, it, uh, if it's a driver for change, yes, for sure it's a driver for change. Is it a driver? Uh, for increasing demand for IT, absolutely, no doubt. Will Ukraine benefit from this? For sure, you know, because Ukraine is one of the, I mean, strong players on the global arena of the, at least of the uh, outsourcing services, maybe not so much on the production, you know, in own the, production. But, but the question, Vlad, is whether we can move beyond outsourcing. Can we move to the next stage is the question. Because of the, the supply changes, the supply chain changes, because of what's happened in this virus, is that going to stimulate a significant move to the next level of value add production, whether it's in IT, whether it's in food or other? I think there were many, many nudges, many pushes to have to, to impact it already in the past. Uh, and there are there were, and I think there is even a group uh, in Kiev which is which has been working on this, uh, how to create uh, the different uh, so how to add the, the missing puzzles uh, to the Ukrainian. IT ecosystems, uh, which is not only the education, not, I mean, it's also including like marketing, you know, you need to not, not only really to do outsourcing, you need to do a lot, a lot of more, including development of the capital market, the development of the venture capitalism in, in the country. All of these are important elements. Uh, and uh, I do hope that COVID will make another nudge for that, uh, you know, but as I said, uh, there, the nudge was supposed to be there already for years. Yuri, did you want to add something? on the changes that you would expect the, in the, the opportunities that you see for the Ukrainian economy. I agree with Vlad, you know, Ukraine is the land of opportunity. We had so many opportunities in the past and they were squandered. And I, I, I sincerely, I guess I'm mixing my forecast and my hope that <laughs> right. you know, this time will be different and we'll make a qualitative transition from being an outsourced country to a production country. Yeah. All right, next question, next question from our participants. Given the changes that you forecast, which skills will be required by, by people after the corona crisis? We talked about workforce development. We talked about investing into skills. The question is, which skills do you think are going to be most critical post-corona? You know, being uh, able to use Zoom is, is going to be very important. <laughs> But, you know, I guess in general, uh, what, what is great about the education system in the U.S. is that it teaches you general skills and you can transfer them from one occupation to another. Unfortunately, in Ukraine, education system is more kind of focused on a very narrow set of skills. And uh, given this in certain environments, it, it's hard to 
uh, you know, believe that one set of skills is going to uh, help you in the longer run. So I would say, you know, flexibility, transferability of skills across, you know, various occupations uh, or jobs is going to be a key for success. Yeah, it's a, it's. I think it's a it's a it's a question for another um, another group, you know, another big panel. You okay. know, it's, it's it's a big big issue. You know, and uh, uh, you know, I think uh, we just need to uh, again. There is nothing. The trends are there. You know, the trends are there, and uh, I think one of the trends, uh, and uh, I I agree with uh, with you about the transferability, but. Uh, the, in, in Ukraine, the education is a is a, an an end process. So you finish the school, the university, and you end learning, you know, factually. And I think what is the major thing we need to think, you know, globally in, a, in the in the long term, is that it's a lifelong exercise. You know, we need to continue learning. You know, being even in the in the older ages. So we have two more questions before we close quickly. It seems that our economy is based on consumption. This COVID crisis has made us purchase less, spend less on entertainment. Instead of going to the shopping mall, we now go to the forest. How should the structure of our economic system change so that we don't depend on just buying more things? Consumerism, consumer spending. A good question. Yeah, I would say consumer spending is going to be with us forever. Consumers will have to spend. Uh, what they will spend on it will be different. Social, as you know, Lot said earlier, social distancing is going to be the norm for many months to come, maybe many years to come. And so, in this sense, you know, some sectors are going to be adversely affected. But you know, as the question suggested, there is a bright spot in that. Like you know, people should exercise more, spend more time outdoors. That's, that's a great opportunity to improve health and. Uh, and the economy at the same time. All right, last question for you both. Quick answers. What is your advice for the Ukrainian government, Ukrainian citizens in this situation? What are the key challenges for policymakers in Ukraine? Narrow it down to Ukraine for our participants. My my one, one advice is uh, uh, to, to, to try to be and to remain the island of adequacy in the world. Uh, and to to uh, to be maybe not to to remain to remain, uh, and because this is will be much demanded, uh, you know, in the in the new normal in the global, uh, I mean, decline in general, and second is to be a reliable partner for those for whom we are partners, you know, uh, because I mean we need to to, to keep our uh, obligations contractual obligations, uh, including for corporate and therefore any protectionism measures, they're not helping, you know, when you're limiting imports or limiting exports, it's not helping to the global economy and also to Ukraine. And the third is, as I said before, the institutions, you know, institutions is a must. We really need to increase the, the, the credibility of the institutions because this is something, someone or something where people should look at when there is a crisis, you know, they, 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 they need to rely on something. They need to rely on the state. And if they cannot rely on the state, if the state start questioning, do we have someone who can protect us? This is a very dangerous and existential question, which we don't want them to ask. Yura? I agree with Sarison what I uh, said just now and before, especially that we really need to rely on professionals. We can have random patients and chaotic responses. We have to have professionals sit down, work out a consistent strategy and stick to it. We, we don't want to have uh, defaults or anything like this. It would be a disaster. Thank you very much. I, I wanna take this moment to thank our guests today, Yud and Vlad for sharing their insights, their perspective. I think if you just take away some of the key words from today and think them through, you know, coordination, optimism, consumption, institutional, quality, empathy, flexibility. Um, I think that uh, we have learned a great deal today and I urge the rest of the community to, of our viewers to stay online today. Join us later for sessions on climate crisis in perspective on leadership. And then tomorrow, join us as we focus on Ukraine and Saturday on the individual, all in times of crisis. Thank you. 
Thank, thank you. you, Natalie. Thank you, Yuri. Thank you, Vladislav, for a fantastic, very dynamic panel discussion. Uh, not that optimistic, but uh, realistic, and uh, you showed different perspectives. Uh, I think it was very valuable for our viewers, participants. Uh, we received a lot of other questions online. Uh, we will try to follow up with them. Uh, but thank you so much, Natalia Reskov, Vladislav Rashkovan, and Yuri Gorodnichenko for being with us, with this panel. And I highly uh, appreciate all our participants join our next two sessions, which will start in four minutes. Thank you, and have a good day, those in uh, that part yeah. of the world. Thank you. Bye-bye.